Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, today, myself, Christina, and Beate from the UK Data Service, we're going to be discussing solutions that secure data facilities can implement to ensure reproducibility for papers based on personal and confidential data. We're going to see that in, in theory, there are a couple of solutions out there, but one key area that we want to actually understand better is what would be the best solution from a researcher point of view as well. So we are going to, to start initially if my slides are working, of course, with a very brief icebreaker. Um, if you follow the link in the chat, I'm just pasting it now into a browser, or if you scan the QR code on the screen with your mobile phone, there are just a couple of questions that we want to ask. And we're going to run this for three, four minutes. It just gives people more time to join us. Um, we know we were just saying um, previously with working remotely and so many online sessions, um, it's quite easy to, to run from one Zoom to another or from one Teams to Zoom and so on, quite back to back. So trying to give everyone a bit of time. Apologies about that. The link is now in the chat. Um, it only went to the to the house because that was my um, option. So please follow the link in the chat now um, or scan the QR code on the slide. Um, and I will start sharing the web page. In here, you can also scan the QR code on top, um, on the right corner. Um, that will take you to the survey as well. We can see a couple of people started completing, and I can see more people are joining us. Um, so we're just doing a little icebreaker for our presentation, um, trying to get to know everyone that's in the audience. Um, the very first question is, which of the following stakeholder groups do you primarily identify with? Um, and we can see we have PhD students, professional practitioners, not-for-profit researcher. We're just trying to find out more about what kind of research you are doing. And at the end of the session, we also have um, a similar survey, but looking at the solutions that are able to um, enhance reproducibility when it comes to secure data facilities. So trying to see whether a solution is more fit for a purpose for everyone, no matter their background, their stakeholder group, or, their, or the domain they are, um, they are working in. I can see a couple of more people join, so I'm just quickly going back. Um, if you'd like to join the poll, um, you can follow the link in the chat or scan the QR code in the right um, corner of the screen. Um, there are just four questions trying to get to know each other um, in, a, in a Zoom webinar format. So the next question is, which discipline best represents your primary area of research? Um, we can see social sciences are in the lead, uh, but we also have health and life sciences as well. We did, we did think that the, um, most of the participants will be from social sciences, health and life sciences, um, and maybe um, arts and humanities as well. Now, trying to, to think more creatively, what is the first word that comes to mind when you hear reproducibility in the context of research? And we can see we have quality, open, assurance, transparency, all words that would come to mind when we hear reproducibility. And this is why we want to do the talk, because at UK Data Service, we do want to lead on the discussion, how can we ensure transparency, assurance, quality of data and openness of data by ensuring reproducibility even in safe uh, data facilities. Of course, it's much easier when we're talking about open data that one can just download or safeguarded data that is behind an end user license agreement um, because, of course, you can provide the link to where the data is hosted um, much easier when it comes to Secure data facilities is an entire process of application to be able to gain access to that data. And our final question, what single word best describes a challenge you associate with reproducibility in research? Cleanliness, um, perish, access, 
exactly access is, is the most difficult one um, in our experience as well. Publishers, more and more um, journals are now asking for um, reproducible research. And this is one of the main drives of the discussions that we're having around ensuring reproducibility in secure data facilities. Uh, because we're going to see there is a there is a current way of ensuring reproducibility, but journals are trying to move away from that because it's not as transparent as it should be. Now I'm going to change my share back to the PowerPoint presentation. I think we've allowed a sufficient time for everyone to join. Um, so thank you all ever so much for joining us. I do hope you have enjoyed the, the icebreaker and it's really nice to get to know you. Brief introduction about ourselves. I'm Christina Matter, the Data Collections Development Manager at UK Data Service. In my role, um, I am leading on ensuring that data are made available for social and economic um, research via the UK Data Service. Service. This includes large-scale governmental surveys, um, longitudinal data, but also smaller-scale academic research as well. I also lead the research data management training portfolio because, of course, in order to be able to have all of this data shared, we need to support researchers understand how to make data available, how to clean their data and publish their, their data. I'm going to pass to my colleague for a brief introduction. Thank you, Christina. My name is Beate Lichtwald. I work in user support and training, and uh, I'm also representing the UK Data Service in the International Data Access Network. And our aim here is to make controlled data or secure access data available abroad and also to make uh, international secure access data available to our UK researchers via our safe room. I'm also co-chair of the um, International Secure Data Facility Professionals Network. This is basically a network where practitioners and, and leaders of secure data facilities um, discuss problems of the present, but also of the future. So, for example, we also discuss uh, topics like what we are talking about today. How can we ensure reproducibility? Because we are all facing similar challenges, um, although we are at different stages in the development of secure data facilities. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Bart. Now, moving on, um, what are we looking at today? We will do a brief introduction to UK Data Service. Um, if you have not heard of us, uh, we hope it will offer um, a great deal of data that you can use. But the main focus of our um, talk is reproducibility in secure data facilities. So we first start with the current situation. What is happening now? What are the journal's requirements? But also, what are the landscape changes? Um, we've come together with, with different colleagues and we've looked at what potential solutions might look like. Um, and the most feasible ones are these two scenarios where a reviewer is allowed to do conduct the reproducibility test within the secure lab, within the secure data facility. Um, we, we refer to them here as trusted research environments as well, or scenario B where a reproducibility service is established by the data provider, in our case, UK yes, Secure Lab. We're also looking at the outlook and we're going to have a brief discussion because we really want to hear back from you what solution would work best for you or whether you have any other solutions in mind. So when it comes to UK data service, we host the largest collection of social, economic and population research data in the UK. And it's not only providing access to this data, it's actually providing support, guidance and training in order to facilitate high quality social and economic research. And also education as well. A variety of our data sets are actually used for teaching purposes. The discussion today firm parts of our aim to support researchers throughout their data journey. So not only giving them the data, but supporting them meeting, for example, reproducibility requirements imposed by journals. UK Data Service is a partnership. Uh, Beate and myself, we work at UK Data Archive based at University of Essex, but we do have colleagues in Manchester at the Katie Marsh Institute for Social Research. Um, they lead on, on teaching and aggregate data, our GIS colleagues that lead on impact, um, and our ADN University of College London that lead on the census data. 
We also support the development of best practices for data preservation and sharing standards. And we're part of different consortiums. So for example, CESA, the Consortium of um, European Social Science Archives, to ensure that other repositories make fair data available and support their researchers throughout their journey. When it comes about stats, uh, we have over 9,000 data sets in our collection, um, with around 300 new data sets and new editions added each year. For the long-standing governmental or longitudinal survey, they do get updated, um, some quite regularly, depending on the methodology they're using, and this is where the new editions are coming from. We have around 48,000 registered users, um, and they account for 130,000 downloads or accesses of data um, in a year. Um, we've made a, a brief calculation, and every six minutes, someone accesses data from UKBS. Um, which I, I think is quite great. It shows that we do live in a data-driven world um, and more and more people are using data. In terms of researchers, and it's really nice to see that the icebreaker covered different um, types of researchers that we have at the service as well. We do have a lot of academic researchers and students that use our data, our, our training services. But also we have government analysts, charities and foundations, independent researchers and think tanks, and also business consultants and data analysts. So we need to, to ensure that our proposed approaches do fit the entire um, designated user community. Data sources are very varied. We have national statistical authorities. We make available Office for National Statistics data as safeguarded data. So we know that on the ONS website, there's quite a lot of um, open data sets that are made available. However, in order to be able to conduct more research, we do need more granularity in the data. So this is where the variables are a little bit banded. We don't make available the full ethnicity variable. We ban that and we make it available as safeguarded data. All of that data is available via UK data sets. We do have other government departments that deposit data with us, such as Department for Work and Pension, um, Department of Transport, intergovernmental organizations, such as the Home Office, different research institutes, the Center for Longitudinal Study, um, ISER as well, um, Economic and Social um, Research um, Institute, but also from individual researchers as well. Um, our visual repository does contain um, more experimental data and even trials data as well. Now, the focus today, rather than on safeguard this data, is our secure lab. We first set up secure lab back in 2011. It's quite unbelievable when you think about it. Um, and Working with the Office for National Statistics, we came up with a five safe framework to facilitate access to this sensitive confidential data. Under legislation, this is personal data. It needs to have a lot more safeguards in place to be used for research. So when we're thinking of the safe data, we do ensure that there's nothing that directly identifies participants in the data, but the granularity of the data is so high that it does constitute personal data. So in order to protect that, we put in place safe projects, which means that all the projects need to be approved by the data owner or the research accreditation panel, and they need to demonstrate public good. Safe people, researchers have to um, do the safe researcher training and pass an exam. exam. Um, while this sounds quite scary, the exam is not scary at all if you do the, the, the training, it's very straightforward. Safe setting, the data doesn't leave the secure lab environment. People can only access it remotely. Um, we have now put in place working from home for a variety of our data sets. So researchers can access their computer at work from home and then they can access secure lab. And lastly, but just as importantly, safe outputs. Nothing that needs secure lab can live without being checked by our user support and training team because they need to ensure that there's no secondary disclosure that leaves the secure lab environment. So only by looking at this and having this brief introduction, 
there's quite a lot of steps um, to access data by a secure data facility. So of course, reproducibility is raised as a, as a big question. So what is the current situation? Um, journals, of course, they, they do appreciate that it's quite difficult to reproduce um, papers based on secure access data. So what they are doing now is actually accepting the code that the researchers are using. Some of them advise researchers to submit the code to a code repository. Um, it might be something like GitHub, or if they use the data from a specific data repository that can be submitted to that data repository as well. So there is a workaround, but going back to the icebreaker, when we think of reproducibility, we do think of openness, transparency, just Putting in the code is not just as transparent because what if the code doesn't work? They raise that question there. And for someone that actually wants to reproduce that work, currently they would have to go to the entire process of application. And even there, there is a question mark. Could they actually get access to the data that the researcher used? Um, we Selected PLOS um, as an example of a, of a journal because they do have a very nice data availability and clear data availability policy. They're clearly explaining that they do appreciate that there are ethical and legal frameworks in place and they do not wish to contravene that. So this is why, while they are insisting on the data to be made available and authors should deposit their relevant data in a public data repository, they appreciate that not, that might not be possible because of um, legal and ethical constraints. So then authors need to clearly state um, where the data was accessed from, is there any code, where is the code that they have used um, to allow others to reproduce their research. Interestingly enough, one of our secure um, researcher training attendees um, said typically a data access statement saying that secure data can be accessed by a UK data service would be fine. This would be accompanied by R scripts and do files. Um, so we've done a little bit of engagement with our users to see what kind of challenges have they encountered and what kind of solutions have they found. However, we started getting more and more queries around but how can we ensure more transparent reproducibility, despite the fact that a lot of researchers are getting this solution in place. We can see an example of a data availability statement on the slide. They're clearly saying the Millennium cohort study can be accessed from UKDS. It gives the full citation of the study, including the DOI. That's very important because we need to know what edition the data was so that we can reproduce, and also they provide the code in their paper. Now on to my colleague Beorte to discuss landscape changes. Exactly. Um, so as you said, Christina, um, at the moment, the status quo is researchers submit their code, their do files, their syntax to the uh, journal. And um, together with indicating in their submitted paper the exact reference, including the DOI, um, the necessary steps are taken to indicate how somebody else could potentially get access to the data. But as Christina said, not necessarily for the purpose of uh, reproducibility. Now, well-established secure data facilities like ourselves, for example, but also others. Um, we are in, in frequent communication with our colleagues, obviously, uh, across the UK, but also um, across Europe and internationally. Um, we all are increasingly receiving inquiries to enable robust and transparent reproducibility. And we will be required at some point to facilitate and assist peer reviewers prior to a journal article publication. And we see such requests, especially for economics publications. So they seem to be the driver in that dire direction. So in this context of the constantly evolving secure access data landscape, um, reproducibility has become indeed a growing concern for all involved, and that's journals, researchers, and data service providers alike. So Christina and I, in this talk, will develop and examine possible solutions as to how secure data facilities um, 
could handle the new reproducibility requirements for secure access data. And we will also discuss the very practical implications of each of the proposed processes and possible solutions. So, do I have control? I cannot change to the next slide. Christina, please, could you click me to the next slide? Thank you. So what could potential solutions look like? Scenario A would be, we could allow direct access for peer reviewers in the secure data facility and others could do that as well. So basically we are talking all the time about what uh, secure data facilities in general could be doing, but also then refer back to what that would mean for us if we did that, for example. And the other scenario B is we could actually establish um, a tailor-made service within the secure data facility to basically certify reproducibility, basically to stamp it um, and, and basically say this, this has been, um, this is reproducible, we have tried and tested it. So the main aims of our presentation today are in the short run to outline how secure data facilities can support the peer review process better and in the long run, how um, we can help to pave the way for enabling reproducibility of scientific research based on secure access data. So the current situation at the UKDS Secure Lab uh, looks like that. So the original data is within the TRE, Trusted Research Environment or Secure Data Facility. The researcher undertakes analysis within the TRE. Then it undergoes the statistical disclosure control checks of the user support and training team. Then the output and the code is released to the researcher uh, for publication. The researcher prepares everything, submits it to the journal, the code and the article. And uh, after the, the normal peer review process without replicating um, the results, uh, there will be a publication hopefully. Now, in scenario A, that would change to this um, uh, flowchart. So again, we have the original data within the TRE. The researcher carries out the analysis. The output is then released after the SDC checks by two um, uh, output checkers to the uh, researcher for publication. This will then be submitted to the um, journal. And then the peer reviewer would, in this scenario, apply to access the TRE for reproducibility purpose. And we will talk in a minute about the challenges that would pose, but this is how it would go. So then the reviewer will get access and can run the code. That would need to happen via remote execution, and I will explain a little bit later why that is on the original data. And then the reproducibility checks are carried out within the TRE, the reviewer feeds back to the journal, and the publication can go ahead. Now, we have various challenges with that scenario. One is time. At the moment, the application process for accessing secure access data at the UK Data Service Secure Lab is three months. The peer review process is already quite lengthy. And if you now have to add three months for getting access to then carry out the peer review itself, um, that will cause a bit of a problem. However, the possible solution could be to have a new and streamlined process for reviewers. And of course, here we would need to have considerations regarding single and double blind reviews. But this could actually be designed in a different way to overcome that challenge. The next one is access itself. So it is not necessarily the case that you can, as Christina already mentioned, that you can get access for the uh, Soleil purpose of getting access to the secure access data for um, review purposes only and reproducibility purposes. However, that could be factored into uh, the deposit license agreement and we could overcome the challenge this way. Another challenge is um, obviously, as always, costs. So we would need resources to train researchers and to establish the process and the procedures to allow reviewers access to secure access data for uh, reproducibility purposes. For that, we would need funding. 
And then we have uh, other challenges, like, as I mentioned already, the single and double blind reviews. How do we go about that um, if there are public registers and you can um, basically see who, who are the researchers, et cetera, et cetera. But again, there are solutions to that. And we have just made a note of that here. And finally, technical arrangements within the TIE, so within our secure data facility, um, we would need to have a certain setup that you can, that the peer reviewer can access uh, the code, but not all the other um, folders that we have at the moment in the secular project, et cetera, et cetera. So basically we would need to have a new solution whereby we are establishing a new setup for reproducibility processes, only providing access to the code, which then will need to be remotely executed. So, so the a peer reviewer wouldn't have access directly to the full data, but basically would run the code on the original data, which are in a different folder. And um, just basically to do the necessary bits to reproduce the results um, used in the publication. This is very, very important. And we need to think carefully about that. Now, coming to scenario B, how would that look like? So if we, let's say, established a reproducibility service within the UK Data Service Secure Lab, so or within the UK Data Service. So um, again, we have the original data uh, in the TRE, the researcher does the analysis, the output is checked and released to the researcher, um, the article is submitted to the journal, and then the journal basically requests a reproducibility stamp prior to publication. At that point, the in-house service would uh, run the researcher's code on the original data um, within the TRE. Then all the checks would be carried out. And then the uh, in-house reproducibility service would feed back to the journal whether it was able to um, reproduce the findings or not. So, and then the publication would happen. What would be the challenges for that scenario? Let's have a look. So again, it's time. Again, at the moment, the application is uh, about three months. However, that could be a default access um, controlled via agreement. So basically, th that would be not a huge issue and even easier compared to scenario A. So again, the access hurdle could be overcome by having it as a key com component in the deposit license agreement. And the, the big difference here is the cost. So whereas we would need a little bit of funding uh, for scenario A, we would need quite a considerable amount of funding for establishing a service doing um, reproducibility um, stamps. So, a complete new subservice would need to be established, and we would need um, quite a bit of funding for that. Again, we, we would then consider all the issues around single and double blind reviews, um, but these can be overcome. And then technical arrangements also need to be in place for scenario B, obviously. So the project setup, access to data, documentation and code, where do we put it, um, who has access, for how long. Um, again, we need new processes for that. And uh, again, the same like for um, scenario A, uh, the controller uh, or the peer reviewer from the in-house service would only have access for a very limited time, only to what is absolutely necessary, the code, and would run the code then um, and, and just check reproducibility. Now, there is actually an example of scenario B. So it's not a completely new idea. And that is a French reproducibility certification agency, CASCAD, CASD. You might have heard of that. If not, there is a link underneath that um, uh, illustration. And please click at it and uh, have a look because there is quite a bit of information available. So we also had a presentation of um, Eric Delbonnel and Roxanne Silberman in the ISDFPN. And that was very interesting. And what we took from that was that basically Cascade CSD is a, is a project that was 
run as a pilot or started as a pilot in 2018. It was then a three-year project from 2019. Um, it is now in its uh, four-year extension after that. An interesting fact I found is that the average workload for um, a request would be one and a half days. And I find also very interesting that they also found a very simplified certification specific accreditation process that just uh, lasts two weeks. So they have actually managed to agree with the authorities to reduce that particular um, access process in terms of its time to two weeks, which is fantastic, I think. And again, the Cascade controller will only access data and code for the time of certification. And also they have a way where um, they can basically allow a different, obviously, different data um, Cascade controllers with different skills in terms of which software they are experts in, um, which, which subjects they are um, experts in. And they also mentioned that it's very important maybe to have experts uh, who are not from the same subject, so there is no uh, collision of interest. Also a very interesting point. Now, I would just like to end regarding Cascade CSD with saying that this certification agency for scientific code and data, what basically Cascade stands for, is a non-profit certification agency. And that's created, and that's very interesting, that's created by academics with the support of the French National Science Foundation and the Consortium of French Research Institutions. And so I think very important is to bear in mind the goal of this agency is actually to provide researchers with an innovative tool, allowing them to signal the reproducibility of their research. And here, I think this is the key to signal the reproducibility of the research. So. Um, they don't need to wait for a um, journal to come back and request that particular stamp. But what they can do is to actually request it themselves, and it's free of charge at the moment. So, and then they can basically submit their article to the journal already with that stamp saying, look, there is actually proof that this is reproducible. Um, and and basically, it's like a like a signal for quality, if you wish, right? As we had in the beginning, for example, when we what you also mentioned, what what that actually means for you, uh, reproducibility, and that's actually very important. So it's about um, changing the game completely. From oh, there's absolutely no way anybody can reproduce um, what has been done here. To well, actually. I already provide my article together with such a stamp saying it has already been reproduced and now I would like you to please publish it. I think that's that's really a game changer and this is very, very interesting. And of course, we would be very interested in, in seeing how we can um, facilitate reproducibility for secure access data uh, much more in future. Okay. Now the outlook for the UK Data Service Secure Lab, coming back to the UK Data Service, um, is at the moment, what we do is code submission. We we encourage code submission to the journal. We can't do it. The research has to do it. So, and it goes together hand in hand with a complete data citation, including the DOI um, in the references section. But in future, we will determine the feasibility of a reviewer access um, to the UKDS Secure Lab. That was scenario A, but we will also look into would it be possible and what are the odds of uh, considering a reproducibility service for the UKDS Secure Lab in the long run. And now we would like to come back um, to an interactive uh, part, and we would like to hear from you again, as in the beginning. So this is where the circle uh, closes. Um, please could you uh, join the discussion um, via the browser? Again, there is a same link, and I think Christine has already put it in the chat again. Or you use your phone camera and you scan the QR code. So whichever way. So there are basically... Are quite yeah. questions, so I think more time is, is definitely needed. 
um, to, to think a little bit about it. Anyone having any issues with the poll, um, please do drop a line in the chat if it doesn't work. Um, I've, I've re-put the link, just the same link, um, or again, the same, the, the QR code on the right um, corner. If you scan that, it will take you to the survey. Um, you don't have to use your, your real name. You can put a pseudonym. You can skip the name question. You're just trying to find out more from you um, about how you ensure reproducibility, what would be the best solution for you? Are there any challenges that you envision? Because as Beate was saying, Cascade was able to be where it is because it was all about engagement with researchers. We want to do this to support researchers, so we need to hear from you. One of the questions we are also particularly interested in is between scenario A and B, which do you prefer from your perspective and why is that? I think we have seen in the beginning, we have some PhD students in the audience and maybe you're not at this point yet where you had um, the problem when submitting something to the journal. So it's especially when you're at the beginning of your PhD that might uh, not have applied to you yet, but maybe you have uh, experience, uh, secondhand experience, basically via your colleagues. Yeah, well, that makes sense. So basically somebody said um, scenario B sounds basically uh, preferable because this is something like a stamp of quality. And of course that would be, would need to be an accredited service provider. So basically then yes, um, that would be acknowledged and, and recognized. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, that was interesting because uh, Cascade had uh, quite a bit of take up in the beginning. And as I said, they wouldn't wait for the journal to request it. They would basically go themselves and ask for it to be done so they can actually submit it already um, stamped with a certificate. Yeah, that's also a very important point, yes, that basically peer reviewers might be less likely to agree to peer review with more work to do. Um, <laughs> okay, the next point. <laughs> They're already incredibly slow. Um, well, I mean, yeah, it would slow down the whole process by definitely the three months of getting access and then also afterwards to carry out the, the, the work. Although we have seen actually with with a Cascade, for example, it actually takes one and a half days as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that response. It's very useful. What, what we are actually also thinking is um, it takes much longer to establish um, scenario B and it would be presumably quite helpful to have scenario A while looking into um, setting up scenario B. So as a stepping stone. And is there also something, some answer regarding what methods do you currently use to ensure the reproducibility of your research? You have a trusted peer reproducing your work. Yeah. Ah, okay. So basically that means you haven't used um, secure access data because you wouldn't be able to share the data. But yes, absolutely. That would be the normal procedure for safeguarded data that you can basically share the resources and the uh, data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think this is a 
this is a very valid concern because with with peer reviewers, we we do hear from from researchers that it's currently taking so much longer to publish, and that's not to critique journals or peer reviewer. They just have so much work. So it might be that the reproducibility service that actually has quite a tight deadline to meet, um, potentially at the beginning, it probably is not that doable to have one and a half days, um, I would say. I think in time, maybe that's something to aim for. And, and Cascade has done amazing. But maybe at the beginning, imposing something similar with the output chips for five working days. Um, that would still be much better rather than taking months to have something actually approved. Um, and it's quite similar with, with the feedback that we got from ISIS as well. Um, researchers there um, and data providers, they were more keen on a reproducibility service perspective. I think our main worry from our end is getting enough support from the research community to be able to get the funding to set something like that up because we can leverage legislation very easily when it comes to the to a reproducibility service. It would be much easier than to have it done via a peer reviewer, an external peer reviewer, uh, because it would be people that work within the UK data service infrastructure. We have very um, high standards that we need to follow even when we get hired. We need to, to do a lot of things beforehand. So I think it would be quite easy to leverage that to our advantage to convince data owners to allow that. Um, and it does seem to be the, the preferred method from a, from a researcher perspective. So this is certainly helping in terms of planning for the future as well. Originally, we were thinking solution A might work better for journals. It's definitely solution B seems to, and probably works better for journals as well, because they don't have the time to to have a peer reviewer um, actually apply, because it would have to be, even if it's a straightforward application process, they would still need to apply to be able to use that data. It wouldn't be a, a guarantee. Um, we do something similar in research in the self deposit repository we have. Um, sometimes we get peer reviewers for the data itself, and even that takes usually a couple of weeks um, because it's getting in touch with us, making sure that they have all the details that they need. Uh, there's no discussion between the researcher and the peer reviewer, so they have to wait to hear from the journal. So it can take quite a lot of time. Um, so it, it does seem, I don't know the order, but it, it, it does seem like we might be um, looking at, at getting some funding for a scenario B uh, project. Yes, I think that that would be uh, the, the long term goal. But I would still say that uh, in the in, for the interim, it would be very helpful if we uh, try to implement scenario A, um, as I said, as a stepping stone and also to improve the situation immediately uh, quite a bit. Yes, because there might be, we're, we're generalizing, there might be some journals that actually have the capacity and it would be quite easy for them to have a peer reviewer that actually checks the code. Yes, indeed. And I think actually also by signaling, it is in principle possible to basically um, go down that route of scenario A and uh, have a peer reviewer coming into the UK data service secure lab um, and, and basically carrying out such a peer review. Just by doing that alone, I think it is already um, it already has much more credibility because it's not like it's absolutely not possible. There is no way you could. So basically in terms of quality assurance, this would be a huge step forward. How much it would be taken up, that would be interesting to see, to be honest. I would like to see what happens then. But I think um, the current situation of it not being possible at all is not acceptable in the long run. That can't continue. No, and, and, and it's a pity because the whole idea of reproducibility is to, to ensure transparency and uh, there is no way of making this data accessible under other conditions. They need to be in a secure data facility. It, it can't go out of that. But that doesn't stop us from implementing solutions to ensure proper reproducibility, like we had on the on the previous slides. Um, as people usually share their um, data and all the study resources and all the methods, 
could that not be facilitated in this in clay, the, the secure data facility? I'll just double check whether we have any responses to, to the final one. We're, we're very grateful for, for the discussion. Um, and I think any other comments, the, the Q&A is enabled, um, and I think the chat is enabled as well. Um, we, we do want to hear more from, from, from researchers. Um, and even if ideas come, come later, we have added our, um, contact email addresses here. Um, if you would like to work with us, um, as well, on this project, that that would be much appreciated. Trying to find out more from from your experiences and what would work best for you as well. Absolutely, please get in touch. Then I would like to say thank you very much for attending uh, today's session. It has been a pleasure, and um, enjoy the rest of the research method e festival. <laughs>